So we're going to continue the same theme that we've been talking about really with Don for the last several months. He's got the idea of Emmanuel. I, I think it kind of is a carryover from Christmas time. We've been talking about Emmanuel. What's it mean that God's with us? And one of the things that we've been talking about is that it speaks to this reality that naturally speaking, in and of ourselves, we are, we are in a sense at war with our God, with our Creator. And while we are, in a sense, fighting against Him, He is... He is fighting for us, even as we're fighting against him. But as I was thinking about that sitting in the back last week, what occurred to me was how it's difficult to, to acknowledge or to accept the fact that, that I'm at war with God. In, in some ways, it's difficult to accept that. It seems strange. Um, it doesn't always feel like the case. and In, in some ways, it's not always the case. But, but there is something... To consider, there's something deep to consider there in terms of understanding ourselves, our nature, and appreciating the gospel. So we're going to explore that idea more and come to appreciate God's God's salvation, God's heart, God's love for us more this morning. But before we get into that, I want to I want to do a little exercise with you. Okay, so I've got these lines on the board. I'm just kind of ignore. Yeah. I was going to say ignore those. Now that I just drew your attention to those, try to ignore those. <laughs> Forget that I said that. So I have a little, a little math problem for you this morning. If you're glad you came to church to do math, it's just one little math problem. I don't want you to overthink it. Just hear this, and I want you to try to solve this problem, okay, and see what you come up with. So listen, listen carefully. I heard someone say I'm horrible at math. It's okay. I am too. Listen carefully, okay? Don't overthink it. Just don't want you to solve this problem. A bat and a ball cost a dollar and ten cents. It's been a long time ago. Bat and a ball cost a dollar and ten cents. The bat costs one dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? So, what? Ten cents. Ten cents? Do you know what, Susan? I don't know the answer, but it can't be. <laughs> it can't be. You knew I was setting you up. So here's what's fascinating. If you said ten cents, First of all, the other day when I was working through this, I also said 10 cents. So you're with me. Ian, you're with 50%. It is 5 cents. And we'll explain it in a minute. But you're with, if you said 10 cents, you're with 50% of students at Harvard, MIT, and Princeton who also gave that intuitive but incorrect answer. The answer is 5 cents. Because if the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, then the bat must be a dollar and five cents. The ball is five cents, which then equals a dollar and ten cents. You follow? But for most people, including these brainiacs at Harvard, MIT, and Princeton, they too got it wrong. So, so I'm reading this book. A friend of mine bought me. It's just a New York Times best-selling psychology book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It has to do with how our mind works. And what we just exercised with that little math problem was what you would call, what the authors of the book call, uh, system one thinking, which is just our natural, instinctive, quick thinking. And, and then there's system two thinking, which is the thinking that we employ when we're engaged in a more difficult problem, long division, something like that, uh, concentrating diligently on a certain task. Like that's system two thinking, deeper, more focused, more calculated. If you exercise system two thinking with regard to that simple math problem, you would have been more likely to get it right. It's, it's system one thinking that just says, well, it's easy. It's 10 cents, right? Just automatic. So similarly, just to give one more illustration of this, if you look at these lines, which one is longer? Top or the bottom? They're the same. Okay, maybe you've seen this before. They're the same, but I mean, visually, it's kind of an optical illusion. I mean, it looks like this line is longer, but in reality, it's not. It's just... The illusion created by the way the arrow is pointing, right? So there's there's things that we instinctively think that quick uh, quick judgment that we form in our minds, and part of what we're considering in somewhat of an analogous way is we're learning that what it means to be rescued by God is it doesn't just mean that we were bad people and. We sinned and, and we need God's forgiveness, though it does mean that. But deeper than that, fundamentally, we have ways of thinking and operating that 
minimize God's value, that ignore God's uh, value, that, that are unaware of or not accepting of God's truth. We, we have our own autonomous ways of thinking and judging and and we navigate through life depending upon our own understanding of things. We're Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your, what? On your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. So one of the themes that we have talked about for many years here, but continues to bear fruit in our lives, and by our, I mean Don and myself and our other leaders here, is this idea, part of understanding the gospel, what it means to be delivered by God, is it means that we in our Christian life and following Jesus, we are learning to exercise a little bit of healthy, healthy self-doubt. Not the woe is me form of self-doubt, but a self-doubt that embraces the fact that we need revelation from God. We need God to reveal himself to us. We need his truth regarding his character, what he's really like. And along with that, we need, here's where, here's where we get to the real kicker here. We need his perspective on this world, and we need his perspective on our lives. We need to see things as he sees them. Part of what the gospel, the good news of Jesus opens us up to is it opens us up to this more accurate understanding of what God is really like, which then opens us up to a more accurate understanding of our own lives. The goodness of God as the foundation for understanding our lives, every aspect of our lives. So just to, before I move completely away from this book, I just want to read to you a section about the ideas of the, the two levels of thinking, okay? That instinctive, kind of natural reaction, quick thinking, and the more detailed thinking. The author says, um, many people are overconfident, prone to place too much faith in their intuitions, they apparently find cognitive effort at least mildly unpleasant and avoid it as much as possible. So it speaks to, if you think about that math problem we started with again, you, you just naturally jump to a conclusion, and for the most part, you probably felt confident in that conclusion. And what they're saying is, we would do well to exercise a little bit of deliberation, a little bit more calculated, careful thinking. One last part here, this insistent idea that the conclusions we draw are true makes it difficult to check the logic, and most people do not take the trouble to think through the problem. This experiment, and as the authors develop the lines and the math problem that we walk through, this experiment has discouraging implications for reasoning in everyday life. It suggests that when people believe a conclusion is true, they are very likely to believe arguments that appear to support it, even when those arguments are unsound. If system one, quick, knee-jerk thinking is involved, the conclusion comes first, and the arguments follow. Another topic psychologists speak of is this topic of, of a confirmation bias. You've heard of confirmation bias. It's when we are committed to a certain understanding of things, a certain interpretation of things, or a certain narrative, and then what we do is we go looking for evidence, and we are always going to find the evidence that confirms the narrative that we've already committed ourselves to, that we already believe. So, so why would I even go there? In a Sunday school class, we're going to be talking about Scripture. Why go there? I just want you to appreciate the human tendency, part of our fallenness, to, to instinctively judge, to give too much credit to our judgments, to... To create narratives in our minds that we then look for confirmation of. I, I, I can believe that a member of my family has it out for me on a given day. Maybe just I just they looked at me wrong, they said something with a tone I didn't like or whatever, and, and I start thinking they're they're out to get me today for some reason. And then the things they do or the things they don't do throughout the day is just all confirming in my mind, oh yeah, see, I knew it, I knew they had a problem with me, and, and here it is, more confirmation of that. Well, that, while psychologists talk about that today, it may seem like a relatively new term, though it's not that new. The reality is the Bible has been pointing to this type of thing from the very beginning. 
I referenced Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 earlier. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean on your understanding. We've been looking at Isaiah 45 and 55. And let me just um, have one of you read Isaiah 45 here. I guess someone to read Isaiah 45 verses it's five through nine. I think it's verses five to nine. Turn to Isaiah 45. Someone read that? 5 through 9 of Isaiah 45. You have it? I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me. And men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. And the Lord who does all these things. Drip down heavens from above and let the clouds pour down righteousness. Let the earth open up and salvation bear fruit. And righteousness spring up with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to the one who falls with his maker, an earthenware vessel among the vessels of the earth. Will the clay say to the potter, What are you doing? Will the thing you are making say, He has no hand? Thanks, Larry. So Isaiah 45, what I kind of focused in on there was that idea of woe to the one who quarrels with his maker in verse 9. I mean, last week I, I found myself thinking about that. Don was teaching and you guys are interacting quite a bit. I just kept thinking about that idea of quarreling with our maker. What is... How do you understand that? What, is, what does that mean to you? So why don't you interact with me a little bit here. So what, how do you understand that? Whether contextually here in Isaiah or in your own life, how, how do you understand the idea of quarreling with our maker? Okay. Yeah, does that, does that resonate with you some? Mm -hmm. So even in the text there, he says, um, basically the idea of, hey, you're, you're, you're a pot, you're, you're a vessel, you're a clay pot. Pot, say to the potter, to the maker, hey, what are you doing? Why'd you make me this way? And we could say, well, why did you allow me to go through what you, you allowed me to go through? Have you ever felt that way? Never. <laughs> says never. Okay, maybe once. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. Drip down. Look at verse 8. Drip down, O heavens, from above. Let the clouds pour down righteousness. Let the earth open up and salvation bear fruit and righteousness spring up with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Hmm. So this idea of righteousness coming down from heaven. Salvation coming down from heaven. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what you're saying about that, the righteousness from heaven, like earth. I'm stuck in my mom this morning. We were talking about how when we give our lives to the Lord, the old man dies, and we're a new creation. We're supposed to put on his righteousness. And we really quarrel with God about what to wear because he's like, put on these righteousness I have for you. And our flesh is like, no, these old clothes I have before are really awesome. Let's wear this today. Mm -hmm. And and there's that war mm -hmm. that we want to, we're new creations, but our flesh is still alive. Mm -hmm. And so we battle back and forth with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Daily, say, well, minute by minute, hour by hour. Essentially, saying that 
do you do it? Like, he is calling out goodness. I mean, that's, that's sort of part of the horror of me, though. Come see what's happening in the moment as, okay, God is, God is being good to me. And even in the midst of our hardship, uh, it's going on, God is calling out goodness. God is good. We like to define good. We like to define good. Since when? First breath that the child. First breath we all took and what about biblically in Genesis? We've been talking about for a long time now. The knowledge of good and evil. Eating from the tree. I mean <coughs> in order to appreciate God's deliverance, the salvation that comes down from heaven. Here in Isaiah prophesied, look forward to, and then in Jesus, he literally comes down from heaven to earth. Salvation in body touches down in this world, the person and work of Jesus, right? But that salvation doesn't just meet us at the level of um, behavior and bad decisions we've made, though we've all made them, and we regret them, and we're thankful for God's forgiveness in terms of those bad decisions, the bad external behavioral things and consequences that we've had to bear because of those decisions. But I mean, deeper than that is this issue of creatures, including you, including me, in rebellion against our maker in need of God's deliverance at the very level of our judgments, at the very level of what we determine to be good or not good. And somehow I know better. Somehow I know better. Hey, I know how this life should go. If I was writing the story, here's how I would write it. So, when we talk about exercising some healthy self-doubt, we're not talking about a woe is me, doom and gloom, kind of no confidence. Look, when, you, when your brain tells you 2 plus 2 equals 4, yeah, trust it. But it's also true that your brain can tell you if a bat costs a dollar more than a ball, and a bat and a ball cost a dollar ten, that you're quickly going to say, well, then the bat is whatever. The, the ball is ten cents, and... And then you, as you think through, like, wait a minute, that doesn't work. But if you don't think through it, just quickly snap judgment, come to the conclusion. And throughout our days, I mean, day by day, we can go down to the level of minute by minute, hour by hour, we are just trusting in our own perspective of things. So, so to understand and appreciate God's deliverance is to understand that we need a righteousness, a salvation that comes from outside of us. And that's what this text is pointing to. And part of what it means to be new, because the idea of a, a new creature came up. And, and as new creatures, we continue to struggle with that which is old, don't we? And part of that which is old is this reliance upon our own understanding, reliance upon ourselves, our assessments, our interpretations. Christ offers salvation at a deep, deep level. Yeah, never mind. Yeah. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? Another way of thinking about quarreling with God. It's not only quarreling about our circumstances being what they are, but quarreling in terms of a refusal to believe and to trust that God is good and even allowing what has happened to include even the mistakes we've made. Yeah. 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 I had in my notes here the reference of that. Ryan and I were talking about this the other day, but... Uh, is it Jack Miller that wrote that book? Uh, oh, Gentle and Lowly. Right. I'm thinking of the other one that you mentioned. Jack Miller, where 
this other author uh, talked about the idea of doubt. And he said, isn't it interesting that we, we doubt so many things about God. We doubt his goodness to us. We doubt his plan. We doubt whether we really have hope or not. We doubt, we doubt, we doubt. But we don't doubt our doubts. Like we're sure of our doubts. <laughs> isn't that interesting? Why wouldn't we doubt our doubts themselves? Does it make your brain hurt a little bit? What's that? Yeah. yeah. And, and the text of Scripture over and over in Isaiah 45, we're going to look at Isaiah 55 in a second. I mean, it, it just keeps presenting to us a God who is outside of us, who, who even as we are fighting against Him, is fighting for us who has mercy and compassion on us in that, in that condition, in that state. I mean, it's one thing to like blow it with the little Matt problem that we started with this morning. Although Haley didn't blow it, you got it. The rest of us to blow it. It's one thing to blow that, like what were the consequences of that? Nothing. But I mean, as we navigate through life and as we continually resort to our own understanding, I mean, the... I don't know if you feel the, the inner plague of anxiety, anger, frustration, and bitterness, discouragement, or depression. You feel that, right? The consequences of that. When we're not seeing, when we're not hearing, when, when, when we're not in that moment experiencing the truth which sets free, but instead we're enslaved to the lies. And, and so as we think about even what it means to be born again and to believe in Jesus and to follow Jesus, part of what it means is to be, to be more clear on the, the deeper levels of our fallenness, to be more aware of those things, to be more sensitive to those tendencies, and, and along with that, more sensitive to our need for God. That, that's what it means to be in relationship with God. We're going to talk about that later in Galatians. That part of Paul's passion and zeal in Galatians is he's saying, Why, don't leave this message. If, if you came to Christ realizing, believing that you have nothing, that you need him, that if you're going to have life, it's going to be a gift of his grace, then don't come under this delusion. Don't believe the lie that you're going to somehow work your way out of this problem. That you're going to somehow get control of things, through discipline, through your religiosity, whatever, you're going to get control of things and you're going to make life work and you're going to get God's help along the way and His endorsement in it and things are just going to get to come together really well for you. I mean, don't believe the lies that your righteousness somehow has something to do with you, something intrinsic to you or something to do with what you do or what your habits are or what your convictions are or anything else, but that your righteousness is completely 100% a gift coming down from heaven to you through Christ. Prophesied in Isaiah 45, fulfilled in Jesus' coming, saying, in me, you are righteous, and there's no condemnation for you. I mean, I've asked this question several times because some of you here are new. I'll just throw it out there for those who haven't heard this. But a lot of times when in men's meeting, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Uh, I've talked about this with people for years now. But when I ask people, hey, is it is it? Is it hard for you to believe or easy for you to believe that God loves you and, and just as you are with all your flaws and all your brokenness? And all, I mean, is it hard to believe or easy to believe? Is it hard for you to believe that, that you are a good creation of God and that he's not angry at you? And so many people have told me, it's hard to believe. I still feel like you, you, you like, the jury's out. The verdict isn't in yet. We have a hard time believing it. it's part of our quarrel with God too. Is we, we quarrel with, in a way, we, we resist the gospel. Yeah, I guess I'll hand over here somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, and that's like what you were talking about. It's probably the thing I struggle with the most and coming from the Catholic faith, right? It's a works-based uh, religion, so I've somehow I've, you know, got to the fact that I guess I'm just not doing this good enough, right? It's, it's on me to figure it out, so yeah. probably don't have these problems. <laughs> yeah. And like, from Catholic background, and, and so often, and even Protestant 
evangelical circles. I mean, this idea that God is still kind of keeping score, that, well, have you really made it? Okay, maybe salvation is eternal security, you can't lose your salvation, but if you don't live a certain way, you might prove that you never had it in the first place. Now I'm like, okay, how do I do enough to make sure that my actions today prove that my profession of faith was valid? Um, as you live longer and longer and go through more of life and find yourself struggling, and as you're more aware of your own impatience and your own anxiety and your own anger and your own everything, that can be problematic, to say the least, to put it mildly. But the consistent testimony of Scripture is that righteousness is a gift. We just read it coming down from heaven. Salvation is a gift. It's unmerited. By grace you save through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? So, whatever your background, this tends to, as I say, creep in. In some ways, it tends to like creep out from the flesh. Right? Let's go to Isaiah 55. And this is another passage that Don referenced last week. It's a great, great passage. And let's um, let's read the whole thing. I'll, I'll kind of work my way through it. I'll, I'll read it and make some comments and get some input. But we'll go all the way through. 13. So it says, Ho, which is funny in my translation, Ho. Like, hey, can I have your attention, please? Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Provisions that cost nothing. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what is not satisfied? Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. The old lad made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you. Because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. God says, I'm up to something. I have an invitation for you. This invitation costs you nothing. In fact, your way of life, apart from this invitation, costs you everything. You keep spending yourself for that which is not bread. There's no life in it. And he says, I offer you life and I offer it freely. And, I, and, and my, my mercy, my faithfulness to David is a precursor to my faithfulness to you through Christ. That's what this is pointing to. So then he says in verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And here it is. The unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways your ways. Right there, what is God saying? Look, my, my thinking is different. Now we can take that on the level of one, uh, the little math problem we talked about earlier. God would not ever get that wrong. God would never be tricked and say, well, that line's longer than that line. He, he would never make that mistake, ever. He knows everything perfectly clearly. His thoughts are accurate in every way, about every detail of the cosmos, from the beginning to the end, and every detail of your life, every hair on your head, Jesus says is numbered, right? He knows everything. All of it. Sometimes it's easier for him to calculate how many are there. <laughs> Some people are not there. He knows it all. And so there's a level of God's 
omniscient knowledge of all things and his thoughts being so far above our thoughts in that respect. But really what this is getting at is, he says, if you will come to me with your unrighteous thinking, your wrong thinking, if you'll come to me with all of your offenses and grievances, and even your quarreling with me, to borrow the context of chapter 45, if you will come to me with your wickedness, if you will come to me for compassion, I will give it to you. I will abundantly pardon you. I will offer you a forgiveness that you will never find anywhere else. Because I'm not like you. Because my ways are higher than your ways. The ways of earth are keep score, keep a record of wrongs done, no forgiveness. If we give it, it's kind of reluctant, and it's even with the forgiveness, so it's like, well, there's a footnote, okay, I forgive you, but I'm also watching you, and if you do it again, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me for being duped again. So I'm, I'm watching. God says, look, I, I, I am abundant in my forgiveness. I'm not like you. Yeah. I'm not like you. If this is foreign, this is alien, this is part of this righteousness that comes from heaven, it's not like this world. It's nothing like this world. I see that hand. I was going to read this scripture later in the service, but just all this stuff is, is amazing. Um, and just points to the dichotomy and the big difference between us and God. Um, I think of my kids, and, and the way we raise our kids is we're raising our kids to move out, go into the world, and sustain themselves. And all of us hope that that's going to happen, that they will no longer be dependent on us. But this is the opposite invitation. This is God saying, no, I want you to be dependent on me forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, come, he's basically saying, come live with me forever. And be completely dependent on me for everything. And he's defining that as a good thing. He sees it's a good thing, we're saying, no, that's, that's not a good thing. Yeah. I mean, is it, so let's, let's play with that idea a little bit. Does it strike you as good news or not good news that you can't trust your thinking? Does that, does that strike you as uh, positive or negative? Is that? Very positive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for, for someone, and some of us, very positive. Is there anyone in here for whom that feels a little bit negative? Okay, yeah. Can you, but we're suspicious of our own reasoning. <laughs> I'm not even trusting my reasoning that got me to that conclusion now. Well, go ahead. I mean, why? Why is it? Because I think I experience this both, to be honest with you. Ryan's like, just just once, just a loss. <laughs> but go ahead. Is there anything else, Brian, you can elaborate? Yeah, I guess because, you know, your, your, your own thinking is pretty internal to who you are. So, like, enemy's pretty close. If I can't trust my own Yeah. And do you think that is a a valid or invalid question? An important or an unimportant question? Is this God or is this just me? It's a really important question. People have done all sorts of things saying, God told me to do this. I heard a pastor recently tell a story of a guy who tried to who was plotting to kill him, and God had told this guy to kill him because if he killed him, then the, the storyline was, God told me to kill you because I'll kill you, and then you'll, he's going to raise you from the dead, and then your ministry will be even greater after you've raised from the dead. There's a great idea. <laughs> but but that's a, look, that, that's a part of a healthy, especially when so often in church land, we there's a tendency to be, you don't have to think about this with regard to Galatians, because Paul gives his, right out of the gate in Galatians 1, he's saying, hey, look, I didn't come from man. I don't have some agency of people. I don't have endorsements from other people. All I can tell you is I was going one direction, persecuting Christians, executing Christians, and Jesus met me on the road to Damascus and turned everything around. Well, that's, that's a unique situation. And for him, that, that spoke to his credibility, but that's, that's a rare experience. We're wise to be cautious about the conclusions we come to. This the minds that, or the thoughts that go through our minds that we can quickly say, "Well, that was God." That was, 
in some ways, okay, that we all experience that to some degree. It's part of being a religious person. But what we're being encouraged with here in the nitty-gritty of life is to exercise a bit of healthy self-doubt. I mean, it's amazing to me. I think about that example of the book. People from MIT and Harvard. And these, I mean, these are the smartest people in our country. And a good percentage of them blow that simple math problem. And these people are going to be the leaders of the free world at some point, probably. And what, does that, what does that mean? Is that disconcerting in any way? Human limitations. Flaws. And come down to the level of the most important things. So, so Don as a counselor, and, and myself counseling him more so in a military context, and me more in the civilian context, and we're comparing notes always, and, and so many things are just all the same. But so often things that plague marriages and plague families and the brokenness and the wreckage, I mean, it's coming out of this place of what people believe and what they're interpreting, what they believe God even showed them, and, and, and all that, and it's just wreckage. And there's a, there's, a tr there's an inherent instinctive trust in one's own perspective. And part of our job is to say, okay, why, what are you thinking and what are you wanting? And can, could you hear it as good news that you can't trust your understanding? Can, can that even be interpreted as an invitation to help? Let me just finish this um, Isaiah 55 text. Which I think is just an awesome picture of the gospel of what Jesus would provide when he comes. So God says, look, come to me. Come for this free provision. I'll have compassion. I'll abundantly pardon you. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. So pick it up in verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven... And do not return without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So will my word be, which goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire, without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush and the cypress, uh, or the thorn bush, the cypress will come up. Instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up. It's like contrasting this desert-like plant, like think picture tumbleweed or something, versus this gigantic evergreen tree that's alive and stable and strong. I mean, it's this picture of fruitfulness versus barrenness. And he says, it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. So here's, here's how this relates to everything we've been talking about. In and of ourselves, we are dead in trespasses and sins. By our own works, we can only accomplish the spreading of more death. And in contrast, God is the life giver. He's the resurrecting God. He's the one who gives life to our death. He's the one that creates fruitfulness and in the place of barrenness. It all comes down from Him. It doesn't come out from the inside of us. It doesn't come from our own performance, our own efforts. It's a gift of grace. When it comes to the most important realities in the world, the most important realities in your life, they are grace realities. They're inseparably bound to the God from whom they come. So we're being invited to, to just question ourselves and our own righteousness and our own ability to protect ourselves or save ourselves or secure something for ourselves or fix whatever. And just listen. Listen to God. Listen to His offers of deliverance and what, what Christ has done for us. The righteousness we have is a gift in Him. The, the satisfaction, He says, you, you come and you, 
You drink this water, you'll never thirst again. In fact, it'll become a, a wellspring just flowing over from you. Never ending. Awesome, awesome realities. And there's and with with that there is great joy, and peace, and celebration. Someday on the other side, we, we will celebrate. It will be amazing partying on the other side. So, I said, hey, is it easy or hard to hear that you can't trust your thinking, that aspects of it are untrustworthy? When are some times when you realize that you are quarreling with God? Are there times when it seems like God is fighting against you? When and why does it feel that way? So that last one was not rhetorical. Are there times when it seems like God is fighting against you? I'm not sure to give an example. With somebody else whose behavior <laughs> doesn't change. <laughs> Kind of along those same lines, like I feel like I have this list of the things that if I could just get these out of my life, then I could just like move up to the next level of Christian. Like I'm hovering here at the C level and I want to move up to the C level. And I'm frustrated by my lack of progress. And my judgment on it is that if I could just get rid of these sins, then it would all be good. And God's perspective is like, well, you're human. Even if I just wipe that whole slate clean. It's going to auto populate a whole list mm -hmm. of things that are again separating me from where I judge mm -hmm. that I want to be. And so I'm at war with my creator almost like the pot. I'm like, why did you make me like this? Why am I still struggling with this? Got my notes for the Galatian sermon. Uh, later this morning, this idea of you know, is the Christian life all about sin management? Is that what it is? Is it, is it about cleaning up certain areas, getting a hold of things, <laughs> becoming more intact? I don't know, maybe it's a complicated question. I mean, my sin isn't manageable. I mean, every time something, like it's something, maybe I look at it and I go, oh, hey, you know, I didn't get angry at that, that mm -hmm. thing that happened. But, I mean, five seconds later, my heart has been something new. I mean, so on one hand, my sin is not manageable. And on the other hand, my relationship with God is not something I can also manage. So, again, I sit in the Independence saying that I, I, there's nothing that my hands can do to help for, you know, please rescue me. It's about surrender. It's about surrender. You want to elaborate on that at all? Well, I don't think you can eat that. It's just an interesting to share. If you try and think about it, they just go around and marry you around and Jack. I remember when I came here to see the front of it. Yeah. I remember sitting on closer to the front. I remember asking the question, but you guys finally said to me, you know, what do you think the purpose of the mall is? And I said, somewhat right. Now looking back at it, how arrogant is that? My thinking was, I will just that that's the goal. And to serve the community. And I still have that. What do we say? And how do we have a spread for the month? And that's, that can't be the goal. 
So because I know that can be confusing, okay, in some ways scandalous, I want to be really clear. That everything we've talked about this morning is about God's truth, God's light, God's life, along with that I use the word, but God's love. We're going to see in Galatians, love, joy, peace. Those things are miraculous fruits of God's spirit. And they absolutely happen. God has poured out his love within our hearts, it says in Romans. But so often what we're trying to do and what our flesh gravitates toward is getting control of things and cleaning things up so that we can get to a place where things are intact. And we can we can co-opt God in that endeavor. But what if what if God's purpose is is not some kind of ideal that we can conceive of? What if his purpose is is relationship? Period. So think about along with that. Think about even when we do tend, because we all do. We think about our lives in terms of managing our sin. And, and in some respect, I want to be really clear. Like, I want you to think about how you treat people. Your spouse, your kids, your neighbors. Absolutely matters. And be aware of it. And, and the more we teach, and the more scripture you read and hear, the more you're going to be in tune with what love really is. Not just these superficial stuff. Well, I you know, did some nice things. I bought Girl Scout cookies. I walked an old lady across the street. I did some. But I mean, the level of like, Patience and sacrifice. Like, think about it. Jesus says, love as I have loved you. Let that go with you wherever you go. Love as I have loved you. And as you endeavor to do that, and as you continually fall on your face, when you realize how high the standard is, when you realize what his love is like, as you do, you're going to find yourself in a quandary. You're either going to minimize what you think sin is, you're going to aim toward a goal, an ideal of what you've conceived of in your own brain of what you think you need and where you need to get to, or you're going to have to submit and say, God, you're God. You have that kind of love. You have that kind of joy. You have that kind of peace. And I need it. From you. I need your miraculous provisions. I need you. So that we're not working our way out of dependence. We're not, we're not growing to become more like just in that sense. Even the Romans 8 passage, which is the only one cited where people say, well, see, I'm becoming more like Jesus, as if he, he's the exemplar, and I'm following, I'm just trying to make myself, or God chiseling me like a piece of stone, like a piece of granite, to turn into a, a beautiful piece of art or whatever to look like Jesus. The, it, the word is literally formed with Christ. Like, you are being... Your life and all the hardships and difficulties and failures and ups and downs, God is using to help you depend on Him. To help you cling to, to believe in union with Christ. And that union is not something by efforts, by works that we somehow secure or improve. It, it, it is a reality. Our biggest struggle is not in the level of behavior. That's where we tend to focus. It, it is deeper. It is at the level of belief. What we believe, all that stuff we've been saying about our instinctive ways of thinking and interpreting our circumstances, that's all has to do with what we believe. And rescue happens at the level of belief, faith. 